James chapter 1, verse 13 puts it this way. Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. And then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. Now, you've got to see the cause and effect here, okay? There's cause and effect. The cause is idolatry. The effect is sinful desires. Sinful desires lead to temptation, sin, and death. But it all starts with idolatry. Now, when you hear the word idolatry, most of us think those little carved statues that in the Old Testament they used to carry around, put in their back pocket for good luck, and they carried them in their saddlebag and put them under their pillow at night. And all of us would say, well, I'm no idolater. I may not be perfect, but I'm no idolater. But friends, an idol is nothing more than a substitute for God. And the reason idolatry is so prevalent today is because God made us worshipers. Every person on the planet worships. The, cre- the question is not if we worship. The question is what do we worship? Because every person who breathes air worships something. And God created us to worship that which is most important to us. Idolatry often begins when God doesn't do what we think He should have done. And so what we do is we turn away from God to created things because they're a whole lot easier to control. But the question really is, Do I want God, or do I really want what I think religion promises? Because for every one of us, there is a God who is, and there is a God we imagine. And the turning point of every life is when we stop seeking the God we imagine, and we start seeking the God who is. Now, here's the great thing about God's Word. No man could have ever explained what we're about to see in God's Word. No man could have done it. Only God could have done it because God created us and God knows how we work. So here's what we're about to see. If you'll look at verses 7 and 14. Verse 7 says, and do not become idolaters. Verse 14 says, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. So what he's talking about here is idolatry. And sandwiched in the middle of verses 7 and 14 are three temptations that are common to man. So here's what Paul's saying, and again, no man could have explained this to us, only God could have. Here's what he's saying. If you and I have veered into idolatry, three sins will become known. Sexual immorality, tempting Christ, and complaining. So let's look at these individually just for a moment. The first temptation that's common to man is sexual immorality. Verse 8, nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 fell. Now, this is a reference back to Numbers chapter 25. You can make a note of that. We're not going to take the time today to go into that, but it's, it, it's from Numbers chapter 25. And here's what happened in Numbers 25. God's people had come out of Egypt, spent a long time in the wilderness, and so while they were in the wilderness, they began to make friends with people who didn't know the Lord. Well, they began to have sex with people who didn't know the Lord, and those people invited God's people to worship foreign gods. 
And they began to do so. They decided that it was a good thing to trade gods in exchange for sex. That's why it's idolatry. When Paul says sexual immorality, it's this little Greek word, pornuo. And some of you hear the word pornography in that. Okay? It's very, it's actually a very expansive word that means sexual sin of any kind. So whether it happens between our ears or whether it happens in our behavior, it fits what Paul would call pornuo. Now, can we agree that this is a common temptation in our culture? It's everywhere. Advertising executives tell us that we witness somewhere between 3,000 and 21,000 images per day. In 1983, only 10% of those were sexually explicit. By 2012, 33% were sexually explicit. Now, we can't take in that many. They tell us that we can only receive 247 images, which means that 82 images per day of what we see are sexually explicit. Now, I'm not talking about full-on online porn. I'm talking about anything that causes you to sin. It may be the, the Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition. Guys, it may be the Victoria's Secret catalog that she gets in the mail. It, wh- whatever it is that causes you to sin is what Paul's talking about here. Now, this word pornuo actually comes from a Greek word that means to sell off. And sometimes this word is translated in Scripture as prostitution or prostitute. You may say, now, now Pastor, I've, I've never, I'm not perfect, but I've never sold myself for money. But friends, the Bible makes no distinction there. Because if we've ever committed sexual sin, we sold off our purity for something. Now, now I want to say something here. I know this is a hard word. You may be thinking, you know, I'd rather hear a grace message than a message like this today. (laughs) But I, I want you to receive this as the Lord intends it, okay? Romans 2 verse 4 says, it is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. It's not the anger of God. It's not the wrath of God. It's not the threat of hell. It's the kindness of God. And the word grace actually means gift. All of God's word is a gift to us. And so if the word of God comes to strengthen and support and encourage you, praise be to God. But if the Word of God comes today to correct, praise be to God. What God is saying, Hebrews 12 says, God disciplines those He loves. You, You need to receive this as the love of God, who's saying, don't continue down that path. That path ends in destruction. You don't have to go there. My wife and I have five children, and the last two homes we've owned have actually had staircases. Well, babies in staircases... Don't make for a good recipe. Because as soon as they learn to crawl, what do they want to do? The first thing they want to do is crawl up the stairs. And so we had to train them not to. And they'd get up on the first step and the second step, and we had to go pick them up and pull them back off of there. And they would cry. They'd get so mad at us. You're not letting me have what I want. But look, you know that there's a possibility they could get all the way to the top and fall down and break their neck, all right? So in keeping them from having what they want, we're actually protecting them from harm. And if the Word of God comes today to correct you, you need to receive this as the discipline of a loving father. And, And you need to understand that if you had everything you want it would kill you. It would, be, it would be 
a, an unloving father who gave you everything you want. And I want to also say this. I think this is, this is prophetic for some of, some of us here today. If you're stuck in pornography and you can't seem to get out, there's a reason for that. All right? More hard work and more self-discipline and another internet filter won't fix it for you, as good as those things are, because you're treating the symptom and not the root. Scripture tells you what the root is. The root is idolatry. Turn your heart back to God, where you desire God above everything else. You know, most of the people I've counseled who have fallen into sexual immorality will say this to me, you know, pastor, I know God doesn't want me to do that, but I wanted to do it anyway. Well, you've just placed yourself above God, which is by definition idolatry. But you don't have to stay there. All right? Here's the second temptation that's common to man. Verse 9 is tempting Christ. Nor let us tempt Christ. Some of them also tempted. And were destroyed by serpents. Now, it's a a reference back to Numbers chapter 21. They, They had again, come out of Egypt. They were coming through the wilderness, and they began to tempt Christ. And here's what they said. You know, Egypt was better than this. We're sick of this food. There's no water out here. We're always thirsty. We're not, there are not enough graves in Egypt. for We're going to die out here. And Paul calls this tempting Christ or testing Christ. Now, what exactly is tempting Christ? Tempting Christ basically says this, that God's past behavior is no indication of his future behavior. That what I have right now, the provision that God has given me today is not enough for me. I want more than I have right now. And so when we're dissatisfied, often what we'll do is we'll go acquire what is lacking for ourselves. And we most, most of the time we do so by sinning continually. And what happens is somewhere deep inside of us, we know it's wrong, but we see how far we can go until the spring tra- the, the trap springs. And when the consequences for that sin fall in on us, we say, you know what? Man, I just don't think a loving God would treat his people like this. If God wants me to trust him, he's going to have to step up his coverage a bit. Here's here's basically what we're saying. God, if you love me, you'll do this. And God is saying, my goodness, have you not seen what I've already done for you? You were a slave in Egypt. And with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, I set you free. Do you have any room to doubt what my intentions for you are? The Bible says that actually the troubles we walk through are intended to raise these questions because high on God's list is that you and I confront the issue of his character. Who is God to you? So that you can stand on your own and say, I don't really understand what's happening around me, but this I know, my God is faithful to me and he will not leave me nor forsake me. When you can get there, you've, you've gotten a lot of what God wants, all right? But when we begin to murmur, it's it's called tempting Christ. Here's the third thing is verse 10, is complaining. Nor complain, as some of them also complained, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now, scholars don't know exactly what Paul was referring back to here. And the reason why is because these people complained all the time. I mean, pick one, all right? It may, may have been here, it may have been there. This is almost all they ever did was complain. And if you've ever had little kids, you know a little bit about what this is like. 
But here's the ground of their complaining. God disappointed them. God brought them out of a land that they called a land of plenty. It was actually, they forgot, they were slaves. And on the way to a promised land, they were in a wilderness, and they made a judgment about God. If they had waited just a few more years, they could have looked back and seen, well, now, now it makes sense what, what God was up to. But one of, the, one of the most common mistakes God's people make is that we make a judgment about God before God is finished with his work. You may, be, you may be in a situation right now where you're struggling with something and you go, you know what, I don't know what God's doing here. It looks like God's left the scene. I don't smell God anywhere around this mess that I'm in. Let me just say, don't judge God yet. Don't make a judgment about God before God is finished. This, this word for complaining actually means to show smoldering discontent. And most of the time it happens for us when somebody else gets what we want. Somebody, somebody else at work get that promotion that you wanted? Here's the risk. Well, I've been here longer than him. I'm better than her. My, work, my work's a lot better than her work. We begin to murmur. And God's watching, listening. Here's what you need to know. The root of that is idolatry. That's where it comes from. Now, I want, I want to remind you one more time of verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape so that you may be able to bear it. Now, now here's what you need to know, because today you're going you're to be tempted. Here's what you need to know. In that, in that temptation, God's going to make a way of escape. But in the moment of temptation, you're not going to feel like taking the escape hatch. And so what do you do? I want to I do this sin, but I know that I shouldn't. What do you do? Here's the escape hatch, trusting God's promises. It's actually the very same way that you got saved. And so here's what we say. God, I choose today by an act of my will to believe that your promises are better than whatever this sin is tempting me to do. And so I'm going to say no to this, and I'm going to believe, God, that what you have for me is better than that. And that's the way out. I've been drawn recently to verse 21 of the book of Jude that says this, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. I want to say to you today, friends, keep yourselves in the love of God. I want you to bow your heads, close your eyes. If you're a guest here with us today or you're unfamiliar with Gateway Church, we close every service the same way. And that's by offering everyone here an opportunity to come and receive prayer if you need prayer today. Now, now we're, we'd like to pray for whatever there is going on. There may be something going on in your life that's totally unrelated to what we just talked about. You may have received bad news from a doctor or bad news at work. We want to pray for you. You don't have to be a member of Gateway Church to come and receive prayer today. But I want to say to you today that if the Word of God has come to you to correct, you don't have to stay there. God's not condemning you. God is showing love to you. God is drawing you closer to himself. And what he's saying is, beloved, your heart has veered away from me. Don't stay there. So if you're stuck today, and you feel like the Word of God has come today to point out some very specific things to you. 
in just a moment, we're all going to stand. There's going to be a team of people up here at the front that we, we know and love and trust, and they, they're going to pray for you. But listen, don't delay. If you need prayer, you come quickly, okay? Holy Spirit, we ask that you would draw everybody today who needs prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. I was 19 years old when I gave my life to the Lord and everything changed. I didn't have any desire to go back to that old life. I wanted to walk with the Lord and learn more about Him. And some people helped me to learn the Bible and to learn how to pray and to learn about my new life in Christ. And that's what we want to do for you. I am so excited that you've given your life to the Lord. He's forgiven all of your sins and you're on your way to heaven. But we need to learn some things now about the Bible, about prayer, about some basics of the Christian life so that you can be victorious and live for the Lord like I know you want to. So we've designed a class called Fresh Start. And I want to encourage you to sign up for this class because we want to help you grow in your walk with the Lord now. I love you and I am so proud of you.